you are part of a small intelligence task force. You don't honestly know who you even belong to with respects to what agency. And what I mean by that specifically is that you don't know if you're CIA, DOD, you name it, Lockheed Martin. I mean, you, you've gone through so many different compartmentalized different companies and signed so many different NDAs that you're not even sure who you belong to at what point in time and all of that. You are just known that you are given certain tasks to complete with your colleagues as part of a covert operational team. Now, as again, Clifford Stone had mentioned amongst many others, you have a general idea of what you're doing because again, you have common sense and you've been entrusted with such secrecy but ultimately you're basically sent wherever you go you get paid almost a million dollars a year some of it is in cash a lot of it is on the books as well too but again that has to do with some other things that we'll be touching shortly now the reason I bring this up is because think about you being a part of a team and you're part of a certain team that is known for reconnaissance and asset retrieval pertaining to extraterrestrials so it's nothing new that you know ETs UFOs exist you name it and with that being said you have been designated this time to try and break into a deep underground military base from another country around the world. And you're thinking to yourself, okay, maybe this country, one of two things. This country wants to see if it's deep underground military base uh, operations and apparatuses and techniques to keep every uh, keep regular people out and to keep it hidden so its security apparatuses are intact and, you know, very solidified in a very strong manner. Or it's because, again, you're doing something for the United States government or indirectly for the U.S. government. They don't want finding out and they don't even want the countries in which you're being sent to to find out you didn't want the leaders finding out right and so what ends up happening is you're then told hold on a second you're going to be flying to uh, for example norway and then you say, okay, no problem. You get on a plane, the whole thing, they knock you out. This is normal. Again, very compartmentalized in terms of what you do. This is part of the normal process. You don't really freak out. You wake up. Next thing you know, you get off the plane. They're, they keep telling you you're in Norway, but you know you're in the United States. You know for a fact, but you don't say anything. And then you realize to yourself, my God, it is so compartmentalized that the guards in which are guarding this deep underground military base don't even know that we have to go in there to retrieve certain things. You are literally working against, uh, you could say, your own nation, your own in intelligence agencies, plural, meaning multiple, in because of how compartmentalized things are, which is why I would subscribe and lean to the ideology of what people like Mr. Uh, Staff Sergeant Clifford Stone said, which is that you know more than you're supposed to, but you don't know everything. And for those that claim they know everything are lying. And again, I still stand by that because we see that the evidence is here more and more substantiating that those claims. With that being said, let me also say that just to summarize this example, you're essentially part of a private, uh, you know, a contracting group similar to like Blackwater, you name it, right, in the United States. You're being lied to. You're being told that you're going to go get into a deep underground military base and infiltrate it on a country on the other side of the world. OK, within the Baltic nations, the Nordic nations, Eastern Europe, you name it. But then you realize, excuse me, sorry, let me turn this Twitter off here. My apologies. But you then realize that you're actually breaking into one of the facilities that you work in on homeland, home soil in and of itself. And that's when you notice, oh, my gosh, even the people that know about aliens don't even know about all the different compartmentalized programs. Now, with that being said, let me just say again, welcome back to another episode of Let's Get Banned. This will be out anywhere from two to three weeks from now for the public. Members will be seeing this as of the day I'm recording this. Uh, today's episode is called Levitating Islands, the D-Wave Takeover. My take on NRO asset retrieval and Masaru Emoto's water thoughts. Now, I very highly and strongly encourage you folks to listen and watch all the way through, uh, even if you can't do it visually, even with audio, simply because I really do think we're going to bring a lot of this full circle. So. Let's jump right into it. So first and foremost. Let's take a look here at bibliothecaplates.net, okay? Now, let's take a look, for example, at testimony of Master Sergeant Dan Morris. Dan Morris is a retired Air Force career Master Sergeant who was involved in ET projects for many years. After leaving the Air Force, he was recruited into the Super Secret National Reconnaissance Organization, or NRO, during which time he worked specifically on extraterrestrial connected operations. He had a cosmic top secret clearance, which is 38 levels above top secret, which he states no U.S. president to his knowledge has ever held. Again, understanding the the relative levels to his knowledge, and I respect that, that he says, at least to his knowledge, just like how Clifford Stone and Don Phillips and other individuals say, to our understanding of what we know to be the truth. In his testimony, he talks of assassinations committed by the NSA. He tells how our military deliberately caused the 1947 ET craft crashes near Roswell and captured one of the ETs, which they kept at Los Alamos for three years until he died. He talks about the intelligence, team, the intelligence teams that were charged with intimidating, discrediting, and even eliminating witnesses to ET and UFO events. He talks about Germany's re-engineering of UFOs even prior to World War II. All right? 
So again, this is so fantastic because it corroborates many of the different individuals' data points in which we could find to be consistent with a lot of the revelations of the energetic and sort of, I guess you could say, occult-based, magic-based aspect of things. Now, here's what I found to be very consistent amongst whether people like Robert Reed, former NATO, whether it's, you know, uh, again, Lou Elizondo, Chris Mellon, think of them as you will, whether it's uh, Clifford Stone, Don Phillips, again, over and over, the, the, the data points seem to be there. Now, let's take a look at this right over here. I had, and I quote, this is interview was done in September 2000. I had a clearance 38 levels above top secret, which is cosmic top secret. It is the top of all those clearances. Again, this is what Robert Reed said, at least to his knowledge as well, too. It is for UFOs and aliens. No president has had that level or has ever been cleared for that level. Eisenhower was the closest. Well, there are several intelligence agencies. The Army had it, the Air Force had it, the Navy had it, and then there were several secret intelligence agencies. Again, like Don Phillips said, secret intelligence agencies under contract or contractors under the guise of the intelligence apparatus and the national security apparatus. One that did not exist. It was so secret was the NRO. You couldn't mention NRO, the National Reconnaissance Organization. If you're on that level, then there's an organization worldwide called ACIO. That's Alien Contact Intelligence Organization. If you pay your dues and you follow the rules, your government is allowed to benefit from that organization's information. Now, some people call it the high frontier. The Navy intelligence refer to themselves that way sometimes, and they all work together. Air Force Intelligence, Naval, and the NRO were at one time in all a certain part of Langley Air Force Base in Virginia, and most of the satellite interpreters were there. Most of the intelligence interpreters from the Air Force, the Army, the Navy were there, and that's where they worked and interpreted. Again, interpreting the communication of the extraterrestrials. Now, with that being said, Excuse me, let me also make it very clear that he, again, as we say here, he talks of assassinations committed by the NSA. Keep in mind, also deliberately caused the 1947 ET crash, which we could refer to Annie Jacobson saying this about, you know, how this was deliberately done. But again, that's a little bit more of a sidestep. However, we notice here as well, too, again... They were charged with intimidating, discrediting, and even eliminating witnesses. Do you folks remember about six, seven months ago, I did an episode on a public episode, which is still public to this day, about Ronald Reagan and him, the Secretary General of the United Nations, which I believe was a gentleman from Latin America, in the 1980s were about to come forward with disclosure of aliens, but then that particular Secretary General of the United Nations was actually abducted, as they say on the quote-unquote 12th hour, metaphorically referring to many just, you know, days if not hours before Reagan was going to make this announcement but he demanded the announcement be made with that particular secretary general and we wonder why again this secretary general was, was then abducted was then intimidated by a handful of gray aliens and allegedly you know probed the whole thing and when he was returned back to his home after that alleged abduction experience his memories were not faltered with and all that because the NSA allegedly through project mannequin as we've mentioned before wanted this type of simulation or simulatory project and apparatus to work in the sense of of discouraging, again, the Secretary General and Ronald Reagan from coming forward. Now, here's what's interesting as well, too. We'll notice that, as he mentions here, the ACIO, Asset Retrieval Team, Alien Contact Intelligence Organization. Again, I would dare to say, I'm not saying this is factual, but I would dare to propose, again, using the consistency and the data points relative to the timelines of such events stated and agencies mentioned, that this is what Don Phillips was speaking on when he said, there is another Air Force in these United States, and I quote, under contract, that he r will not say. He did not even want to say the, 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 the letters that represent the full-on meanings of the actual agency. Now, this is what's interesting as well, too, as we scroll down, okay? And I quote, one was a friend of mine. Phil Schneider, who worked out here in New Mexico building the tunnels. Phil Schneider. The biggest one that he was involved with was the Dulce Underground Facility. There are people who have been eliminated for what they know. Again, quite uh, quite, uh, quite very mafia-like, if you will, quite organized crime-like. But again, take a look at this right here. But myself, I'm 73 years old and I've had a good life and no regrets and I've loved this country and I've been a Christian all my life since I was about 11. So I believe God wants this known and I believe the cosmos wants this known and I believe that if we don't break our the secrecy, we're doing people a great harm in keeping it so secret. Now, here's what's interesting as well too. Take a look if we scroll down right over here. Germany recovered two UFOs before. It was 1930 and 1932 and they took them to Germany and started like we do now re-engineering they got ahead and even before the war started they had a workable UFO we've got plenty of film 
documentary film to show that in the archives. And then we got a whole bunch more from the Germans after the war because we brought not only von Braun, but we brought Scharberger over here and some of their electromagnetic people who were working on the UFOs and he gave us a jump on everybody else. Again, we also have to look at the consistency relative to if we take a look at the previous live stream that was done a couple weeks ago pertaining to, again, that sort of a very well done expose. There were many gaps, don't get me wrong, but generally in order for informing the people in a more structured sense of the way in which timelines disseminated and were, were executed and laid out, I think it was fantastic. And it's also consistent with Leonid Ivashov's claims in his book as well, too. Now, here's what we'll notice as well, too. You know, and I quote, the South African government admits that they retrieved an ET craft. They don't make any bones about it, and they put on a documentary film that has a police sergeant who's saying that they recovered one. It even shows you pictures of the recovery and so on and so forth. All right? Now, I've read, what I've read is that an agreement we made between our government and them that we would not say anything about them developing and using their first nuclear weapon. That if we couldn't support them in the UN, that we'd keep our mouths shut and that they would give us that ET ship and we agreed to do it and they did. Again, folks, I just want to say before we go on, going back to whether it's the Zoom calls that we have for the members, whether it's, you know, the different public episodes you look at, take a look at how, when I say cheap parlor tricks, again, I'm not saying that always in a negative way when I refer to the elites using cheap parlor tricks when we think they're doing some, you know, major, like, you know, fancy strategical way of, of manipulation and coercion to get away with with not being guilty of things but look at this in this particular case look at how simple things are we have a school system for example that tries to teach us and disseminate these different lies and different senses of again mechanisms that tend to not work or are very strongly outdated whether it's psychological whether it's medical whether whether it's our understanding of history but what i mean when i say for example over here that how look at how simply things work is that again it comes down to human nature of negotiation everything is negotiation okay now take a look at this right here so who's our enemy now and i quote now some would like us like for us to believe and would like to develop the idea that the aliens are our enemy now there's no proof that i have ever read in any official document anywhere unless they were attacked that they ever shot and one instance i'll tell you about involved russia Okay, now here, we, let's take a look at this right over here. I think the aliens are aware that we're trying to build weapons against them. Now, I'll tell you, we do have a defense. We're capable of shooting some down. We've developed that ability. Eisenhower warned the United States public, don't let the military and industrial weapons builder get, builders get in power. He always feared that. And if you look at his last speech, he said to the public, don't let them to become too powerful. So we better wake up. We've tried to shoot down several UFOs and we've been successful. We, we crashed one in White Sands, New Mexico. We were tracking it at the time and we were successful in damaging it enough that it crashed. And yes, there were some aliens on it, and yes, we got them. This happened in about 68 or 69, about the same time the South Africans did it. We don't have a threat from Russia anymore, but if we keep shooting at those aliens, we might have a threat from them. We should quit that. We should demand that our government stop trying to shoot down those aliens and cooperate. Now, he also provided some of the Air Force documentation from South Africa to substantiate this. And again, we now see, again, testimony of Mr. Don Phillips. For those that are members, you'll know very strongly that I've posted uh, quite lately as well and quite frequently a, 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 quite a bit of footage and interview and testimony from Mr. Phillips because again whether you want to believe him to be a psyop or a, a, a particular gentleman of you know controlled opposition or not former private contractor former United States Air Force former CIA former Lockheed Martin Skunks Works divisions again take of that as you will now look at this right over here and this is from Mr. Phillips and I quote even me, um, even more validating for me was that one of our contract scientists for our private concern, Light City Technologies Incorporated, worked with these technologies. He worked with a couple of those technologies while he was with a very prominent intelligence agency of the United States government. Now, if we take a look over here about the ET lenses, there were some eyeball coverings that allowed the people inside the craft that made the journey across space to see in the minimal light that we know is now present during space travel. These lenses magnified light but also brought in a certain type of clarity before I go on folks does that not remind you of the footage in which I've shown over and over on the zoom calls for those that are members that I've also put up on the inst on, on our Instagram as well about the eye the black eyeball lid being removed that sort of lid being removed from the alien, that black and white video that I found off the dark web, is that not consistent? Again, we need to, again, theories to suit the facts, not facts to suit the theory. So we need to look for the data points in which there is an alignment relative to that of other various sources, if you will. Now, take a look at this. And my reason for mentioning this was that it was earth doctors and specialists that got them into the removal and study of these lenses. 
Okay, now take a look at this right over here. What we're going to see if we scroll down a little bit more, all right? I, and I quote, this is testimony of Captain Bill Uhouse, all right? Uh, United States military, retired October 2000, uh, Marine Corps, excuse me. He served as a fighter pilot, and four years he was with the Air Force at Wright-Patterson Air, Fa uh, Air Base. For those that are you know quite familiar with Wright-Patterson, it's a very talked about and rumored location in which a lot of these ET craft would be. Quick little side note, Senator Harry Reid tried to look into what was there, and they said he did not have the clearance uh, to go and take a look at what was happening. Now, Don Phillips mentioned these aliens helping to actually, a particular species helping the Air Force to actually help um, uh, create a simulator, a flight simulator. But this directly comes from Captain Bill Uhouse, who Don Phillips was quoting or referencing. So, and I quote, I didn't start working on flight simulations until about, well, the year was 1954 in September. After I got out of the Marine Corps, I took a job with the Air Force at Wright-Patterson doing experimental flight testing on various various different modifications of aircraft. All right. Now, take a look at this right over here. This ET craft was a controlled craft that the aliens wanted to present to our government, the USA. It landed about 15 miles from what used to be an army air base, which is now a defunct army base. But that particular craft, there were some problems with. Number one, getting it on the flatbed to take it up to Area 51. They couldn't get it across the dam because of the road. It had to be barged across the Colorado River at the time and then taken up Route 93 out to Area 51, which was just being constructed at the time. Before I go on, Route 93, look at the data points. Mr. Phil Schneider had mentioned this quite avidly in his speeches. There were four aliens aboard that thing, and those aliens went to Los Alamos for testing. They set up Los Alamos with a particular area for those guys, and they put certain people in there with them, people that were astrophysicists and general scientists to ask them questions. The way the story was told to me was there was only one alien that would talk to any of those scientists that they put in the lab with them. The rest wouldn't talk to anybody or even have a conversation with them. You know, first they thought it was all ESP or telepathy, but you know, most of that is kind of a joke to me because they actually speak. Maybe not like we do, but they actually speak and converse. But there was only one who would at Los Alamos. All right. The difference between this disc and other discs that they had looked at was that this one was a much simpler design. It didn't have a reactor, but we had a space in it that looked like a reactor. That wasn't the, the device that we operated the simulator with. Take a look at this right over here. We operated it with six large capacitors that were charged with a million volts each. So there were six million volts in those capacitors. They were the largest capacitors ever built. These particular ones, they last for 30 minutes so you could get in there and actually work the controls and do what you had to to get the simulator or the disk to operate. So it wasn't that simple because we only had 30 minutes. But in the simulator, you, you'll notice that there are no seatbelts, right? It was the same thing with the actual craft, no seatbelts. You don't need seatbelts because when you fly one of these things upside down, there is no upside down like an regular craft. You just don't feel it. There's a simple explanation for that. You have your own gravitational field right inside the craft. So if you're flying upside down to you, you're right side up. I mean, it's just really simple. If people would look at it, I was inside the actual alien craft for a startup. There weren't any windows. The only way we had any visibility was all done with cameras or video type devices. My specialty was the flight deck and the instruments on the flight deck. I knew about the gravitational field and what it took to get people trained. Okay. Now, I'm sure our crews have taken these craft out into space. If I'm not mistaken, I don't mean to put words in anyone's mouth, but we know how Plutov allegedly claimed. Uh, I also believe that he mentioned it. If I'm not mistaken, please don't quote me, but I believe Hal mentioned to Jeremy Riss uh, that he had taken a TR-3B or a triangle craft uh, to the moon for a handful of minutes and returned. Now, look at this right over here. Again, looking for the data points before we move on. We had meetings, and I ended up in a meeting with an alien. I called him J-Rod. Of course, that's what they called him. I don't know if that was his real name or not, but that's the name the linguist gave him. Again, reference back to the public episode from roughly three weeks back as of the time I'm recording this, which will pro probably be about a month, month and a half for those watching publicly. J-Rod was mentioned quite substantially. He was one alien within that of the Dulce base, allegedly, that was able to be communicated with within a particular sphere or bubble, if you will, in which humans had to put suits on and the whole thing. I did draw a sketch before I left of him in a meeting. I provided, to, pro provided it to some people and that was my impression of what I saw. The alien used to come in with Dr. Edward Teller and some of the other guys occasionally to handle questions that maybe we'd have, you know, but you have to understand that everything was specific to the group. It wasn't specific to the, if it wasn't specific to the group, you couldn't talk about it. It was on a need to know basis and the ET, he'd talk. He would talk, but he'd sound just like as if you spoke. He'd sound like you. You know, he's like a parrot, but he'd try and answer your question. A lot of times he'd have a hard time understanding because if you didn't put it on paper and explain yourself half the time he couldn't give you a good answer the preparation we had before meeting this alien was basically going through all the different nationalities in the world then they got into going into other forms of life even down to animals and that type of thing and this j-rod his skin was pink was pinkish but a little bit rough 
that kind of stuff, not horrible looking, you know, or to me, he wasn't horrible looking. Some of the guys who were in the particular group that I was in, but they never even made it. You know, when they gave you the psychological questions, I just answered them the way I felt and had no problem. That's what they wanted to know. If you'd become upset, but it never bothered me. It didn't amount to much. Again, they're looking for that emotional reaction relative to your perception of belief within that of the soul matrix, as we are seeing more and more discussed in the new Archon series that we've started. So basically, the alien was only giving engineering advice and science advice. For example, I performed the calculations, but needed more help. I spoke of a book that, well, it's not a book. It's a biggest assembly with various divisions dealing with gravitational technology and the key elements are in there but all the information was there even our top mathematicians couldn't figure some of this stuff out so the alien would assist okay I don't know much about the ET ones that brought uh, that they brought here. I know about that one craft out of Kingman, but that's about it. And I know the company that hauled it out of there who is out here now, but but there's one that operates with certain chemicals. Now, again, end quote, we're going to see here, we can just keep going on and on and on. And I don't mean to just keep reading a book to you folks, but the reason I bring all of this up is because let's take a look at this right over here, okay? New York Daily News.com. Happy Earth Day. Where in the world are these Google Earth discoveries? Take a look at some of the gematria or the sacred geometry and the shapes in which are reminiscent of that, of ancient esoteric influence relative to that of what certain individuals like Graham Hancock, Randall Carlson speak on. Again, take a look at some of these structures. You'll find here some very, very interesting structures pertaining to that of, again, you know, the different tablets referencing, you know, the, the Ten Commandments. We see certain geometrical shapes like this, you know, for example, sh shapes resembling the flower of life. We see, you know, different shapes such as Again, humanoid structures. There's some Nazi symbolism as well that, again, is, is a little bit strange if you ask me. But this is nothing new per se relative to that of what we see within certain satellites and, you know, quote-unquote leaks. Now, this one in particular, this location here, again, we have the coordinates from the Star of David. So for any of you wanting to search that up, the coordinates are here. I've, hi I've um, highlighted it in the bottom left of the screen here. And we'll find as well very strongly that these sacred geometrical shapes seem to be aligning with that of some uh, incursion of mass magic relative to science but there seems to be a separation and i'm not saying this to just sound like a broken record i have come to the not conclusion but to the subscription ideologically that there seems to be a part in which science only goes so far and it's not because of our misunderstanding of things nor is it because of the aliens lack of understanding or potential lack of understanding and you might be saying dave what do you mean the aliens lack of understanding they know more than us yes but just because they know more than us doesn't mean that again they know everything i would dare to say there is a part in which the simulation that we live in, technically speaking, okay, is that in which responds in a very frequential sense similar to that of the Project Carrot documents where that whistleblower claimed when you put that language on whether it was on a table or on a particular uh, metallic substance or on a piece of paper, when you put that alien language from the Project Carrot documents into a certain frequential field, the language started moving on its own as if it how an, as if it knew what to do. What if that is harnessing a combination of both extremely scientific nano-advanced holography in addition to harnessing certain natural reactions of this simulation we live in? And I say that because it could be referred to as magic, but it is simply a natural reaction of energy in which has been composed of the larger composition of how this simulation or reality was developed. And I say this because, as of the day I'm recording this, just yesterday, Sunday, if I'm not mistaken, Avi Loeb, who is the same gentleman, you know, Harvard Astronomy, who is the one... You know, think of him as you will. He's now partnered with Chris Mellon, Lou Elizondo, but he's the one who claimed the Oumuamua was not an asteroid, that cigar-looking type um, a meteor or asteroid, if you will, thinks it's the, the result of advanced alien life. Again, I don't think that it's a coincidence he's coming out now saying that, but Mr. Avi Loeb yesterday said he directly implied, I don't believe he stated, but implied that our universe may have been made in a laboratory. Now, that is not scary from the sense that if we are biologically, again, alive, made in a lab, that's fine, but where does our soul matrix and, and, and our sort of soul tether to similar to when you're astral projecting and you see sort of like you know a cord some people claim or you're remote viewing and you see an energy tether back to your physical body in some cases that is what in which i would describe to be the manifestation of what one would call esotericism or magic separate from that of what could be bent using science within this particular simulation now i say this because if we take a look for example at something right here above topsecret.com again not a mainstream media website interestingly enough this was posted on november 20th 2006 
six, okay? So I find it fantastic and, and very honorable in a way that a lot of people from many years ago are, now we can use these connections for the data points. Islands in the Bermuda Triangle were photographed levitating by as much as 10 miles off the surface of the ocean in this recently declassified image from a U.S. spy satellite. Now, again, unfortunately here, I tried to look for the photo, could not find it. However, there's enough people speaking about it, there were enough people speaking about it, 10 to 15 years ago, excuse me, that seem to, again, substantiate and say, look, this is no joke right? Again, we click on this website and it takes you to a whole separate one. So clearly, again, the IP address and all that has changed. However, what's interesting about these levitating islands is they're relative to that of the Bermuda Triangle, which seems to be using a concept of what you would say, extrasensory perception. Now, again, you might be saying, Dave, I thought that the gentleman you just quoted or one of them claimed he didn't believe in that. Again, granted, but this goes to show you the compartmentalization aspect. Now, for example, if all points in time and space are equal, levitation would be of that using the magnetic frequencies of the planet relative to the Schumann resonance in which Mr. Don Phillips claimed that NASA spent $10 million of 10 mil, uh, excuse me, of taxpayers' money to look for what he referred to, we would now, the public, if we found out, would be magic, literally out of science fiction books. Could it, in fact, have been some type of technology that could allow for this type of levitation? Could it be acoustic levitation? Would that not be the same synchronistic energetic uh, uh, formations that would allow for that type of projection, whether it's craft, whether it's islands, whether it's natural barriers? Now, interestingly enough, too, Mr. Phillips also also mentioned, and we will see this substantiated by Masiro Emoto's experiments as well. Mr. Phillips also mentioned as well that uh, he claimed everything starts with an idea not just in this dimension, but in others. And he seemed to imply that, again, that these beings were also telling him in one way or another, but through humans or otherwise, that the formation of an idea and a man manifestation of one's idea relative to individual consciousness can actually create what you would want to, to, to um, I guess you could say, manifest. And we know this. Again, you might be saying, Dave, I already know this. However, it may be more directly in our faces than we thought. Now, take a look at galacticawakeningandhealing.blogspot.com. Masaru Emoto, Water and Food. Something worthy to reflect deeply on our thoughts, words, and intentions we project and use with those around us as well as becoming mind and heartful of the energies that went in producing, into producing our foods before, during, and after seeing these clips and movies. Our bodies are made of approximately 70% and our brains are uh, of approximately 90% water. Okay? Now, through Dr. Emoto's work, we are being shown evidence of the effect of our thoughts, words, and languages on ourselves and upon the world around us through the water that approximately makes up 70% of both our own bodies around the earth. Water is the very source of uh, source of our life. Now, this is what's interesting as well, too. Mr. Masaru Amoto, if I'm not mistaken, has passed away at this point, but he basically conducted experiments relative to emotion and thought, okay? And what that emotion and thought would be derived from was music, and he would emit that particular music onto a body of water, and the body of water would then form in a crystalline structure depending on the song that was played. He found that more harmonic songs resonated that in which was a more, uh, I guess you could say, structured type crystalline design as we see here, again, using fractality, fractal physics in that same way of thinking now this is what happens when he played the song thank you now we see here this is what happens when he played a heavy metal song with the lyrics you make me sick i will kill you again we find the manifestations of thought seem to be that in which are more and more realistic and i say this because take a look for example if we use modern day uh, drop feeding take a look at the film tenet by christopher nolan again all about perception similar to what that gentleman said there about the gravity the the, the et gravity simulator type craft in addition to that we find again in tenet they say you're not catching the bullet you're not dropping the bullet just don't try and understand it feel it Again, as if we look at Mr. Clifford Stone, they some of them don't understand, uh, do not understand English, and but they can speak it. But rather, they communicate better, just telepathically, telling you what they feel, and you can feel what they feel, and they feel what you feel, vice versa. Okay. Now I bring this up because. If we take a look, all right, at some of these shapes, what we're going to find here is, again, squares inside of circles in some particular cases. And if we jump over here to and, uh, andywhiteanthropology.com, Again, let's play it down the middle. Squaring the circle in the Amazon. Graham Hancock got it wrong. He was recently on, recently on Joe Rogan's podcast. And Graham Hancock misuses, according to this gentleman, or misunderstands the term, which refers to constructing a square the same area as a given circle, not just drawing a square around a circle, and consequently concludes that the societies who made the structures had advanced geometrical knowledge. Now, again, 
there's a gentleman that tries to debunk these claims and what have you, but the point is not about debunking or not. It's about the square inside of the circle. We've seen footage, like I've put on the Telegram for our members. We've seen the footage of these craft being out there, okay? We've seen the footage of the different ways in which there seems to be propulsion apparatuses relative to different forms of different areas around the world that seem to be using blue beam technologies to cover such things up, but what do they always have in common? Whether it's found in nature, whether it's found from a UFO crash, you name it. A square and a circle, Okay, now let's take a look at this right over here. This is thanks to a good friend of the show, Ani, nocturnalrevelries.com. Uh, secret cipher of the euphonauts and the secret rituals of the men in black by alan h greenfield humanity has been in contact with et forces for millennia but we see here in 1904 crowley received a message from awas a discarnate entity with these messages was a key to the cipher messages of the euphonauts or the ultra terrestrials but despite his efforts crowley wasn't able to find the key within the message that he himself had channeled some of crowley's followers discovered the key to the cipher in the 70s okay now interestingly enough we see the jpl the jet propulsion laboratory and many others that crowley performed sex sexual abuse rituals and all that within the JPL facility will find that substantiates again the different forms of magic relative to the separation of science now the question then becomes what is a d-wave machine so let's take a look at the official definition of a d-wave machine we see here d-wave systems is a Canadian quantum computing company based in Burnaby British Columbia Canada it was the world's first company to sell computers to exploit quantum effects in their operations their early early customers included Lockheed Martin University of Southern California Google NASA and Los Alamos National Lab. What are the goddamn odds, folks? Look at their earliest customers. Come on. That's right in front of our faces. Again, we don't have the proof, but we have the evidence to lead us to a substantial conclusion relative to what is being stated publicly, right? Excuse me. Now, we'll see here, okay? If we jump on over to D-Wave, just in case, according to eyeopeningtruth.com, technology is the end of humanity. Even the proponents of transhumanism are telling you that. The fallen angels and their descendants have already arrived and are working to make the earth their home. They are creating bodies suitable for them to inhabit throughout eternity. Unlike humans, they cannot die. They intend to cheat God and claim the earth and humanity as their own. Now, again, we can talk about, you know, the different negatively oriented beings and their agendas and things like this. I would dare to argue respectfully to the individual that authored this particular article that this is a little bit of fear mongering in my opinion but we need to take a neutral perspective before we jump into the fear of oh my god this is happening that's happening you name it right again speaking of cloning ironically enough clonate.com this website has been again you know uh, out there for years and years and years copyright 2006 to 2009 by putting it right in front of our faces relative to that of the bush administration blocking any type of cloning because again you don't think they're doing it underground you don't think that through uh, certain mechanisms like quantum entanglement at an esoteric level relative to what people like Don Phillips, Clifford Stone, you name it, discuss about different realities, we'll find that the D-Wave systems could in fact be harnessed. Okay, now we see here, now, the D-Wave computers that are being built all over the world, along with the 5G technology they need not to run, they're already functioning. The 5G will give them power over you. Now, again, they say, please just, you know, don't shrug this off, the whole thing like that, and we'll find, you know, certain, uh, you know, individuals here claiming with videos from BitChute and, and, and this whole thing. You know, I hope that you are praying every day for God's mercy and protection. Again, make of that as you will. But here's what's interesting relative to the different forms of D-Wave apparatuses. We'll find here that D-Waves seem to be used within the NRO, the National Reconnaissance Organization. And they also seem to be used relative to that within Los Alamos labs. And again, if we tie that in with Christopher Mellon's statements on Joe Rogan, he said that he's spoken to individuals, particularly scientists that work at Los Alamos, who have had some very strange paranormal experiences. And when, they, when they'd go home at night, they'd have some very strange lucid um lucid experiences and dreams that were really really messing with them and we see this because again if we take a look um at over here uh, excuse me over here at reddit.com this is a very simple post five months ago by an individual by the name of you under slash robin underscore goodfella my ufo propulsion theory the unification of toroidal emf propulsion using rail coil gun superconductor electro hydrodynamics and the magnetoelectric effect we'll see that relative to the different proposals this individual makes with propulsion okay whether it's using, uh, you know, super uh, ho nanotech, holographic tech relative to that of infusion of metallurgies or other instances, whether it's acoustic levitation, whether it's nuclear reactor type propulsion apparatuses, we will see here, again, the constant reoccurrence of different types of elements that seem to be that within an esoteric infusion using the same types of geometry seen on, on this website right over here relative to sacred geometry. It is not a coincidence, in my humble opinion, 
that what we see here again you know star of david the different forms of piezoelectric effects in quartz relative to the symbolism written by certain individuals such as walter russell within that of the universal one Okay, we see that the D wave is using different forms of piezoelectric effects relative again to things like linear motors, electromagnetic configuration of coil guns and projectiles of rail guns and high velocity symbolism right over here as seen on again tic tac ufos we find the reoccurring shapes and sacred geometrical forms of languages to be that in which may in fact be a self-thinking or operating language similar to that of again what nikola tesla spoke on similar to that of the project carrot documents uh, like i mean look look at this folks we can go on and on and on look a plasma rail coil gun saucer we see the different forms of propulsion and and we see the different ways in which, again, barium, copper oxide work, and you name it. Interestingly enough, I had a, a nice conversation with a friend, a great friend of our show, Riel, who was saying that, you know, there are individuals out there that propose, okay, how do these beings get past the Van Allen belt? Well, again, if these craft get can actually go access the, the utter core-most layer of this dimension, you would not need to worry about what's outside of you relative to the testimony given back on this website right over here on bibliothecaplates.net of these individuals saying there is no up or down when you're in the craft because it has its own ground gravity type propulsion type uh, uh, gravity propulsion type I guess you could say um, uh, a mechanism if you will now take a look at this right over here and by the way this is according to testimony of AH a Boeing aerospace all right and by the way majestic 12 is real MJ 12 did exist but it does not exist today. The name was changed. I believe the name was changed to Zodiac. The positions are still the same. Henry Kissinger is very knowledgeable about what's going on. He was in the loop, I was told. Stephen Greer asks, who told you this? The AH individual says, a friend of mine worked at the NSA, told me this. He saw Henry Kissinger's name on documents. He saw George Bush's name on some of the documents. I believe George H.W. Bush, not the son. He was made aware of what's going on. About 1978, Reagan was fully briefed on the alien pres uh, presence. Reagan told Mikhail Gorbachev of Russia about 75% of what's going on. And then Gorbachev became very, very close to us. Okay. Again, look at this right over here, folks. A CNN reporter in Washington, D.C., the second time that Gorbachev came to America, was able to interview Gorbachev and his wife. When they got out on the street, they drove the security detail up the wall. And a CNN reporter asked Gorbachev, quote, do you think we should get rid of all our, all our nuclear weapons? And his wife stepped in and she said, quote, no, I don't think we should get rid of all of our nuclear weapons because of alien spacecraft. All right. Now look at this. Now CNN put this story on for the half hour on CNN headline news. I heard this and I jumped up and put a blank tape in to record the next half hour. Well, that story disappeared. And you know who intercepted that? It was the CIA that got involved with that because I know that they were monitoring CNN and all international headlines at that time. They squashed that, but I heard it. And this tells me that my information is correct about Ronald Reagan from my NSA source. The secrecy is just total overkill as far as I'm concerned. And Congress needs to know about this information. Again, we're going to find here very strongly that we see relative to when this was stated 20 years ago, okay, that there seems to be a faction or multiple factions that seem to be encouraging humans on the back end of things to push forward this type of technology, possibly because this D-wave technology has, again, disseminated itself, as we've seen, for example, with the light posts uh, from the recent members only episode in different ways via different commercialized uses, not for the best intentions of humanity, and so many other formations that could, in fact, use the D wave systems to harness in a negative sense again the different forms of masiro emoto uh, emoto's water thoughts okay relative to the harmonic frequencies that may in fact be occurring all over us all around us again keep in mind folks these are testimonies made from 20 years back so it only makes you think about what different factions behind the scenes are working on this what different routes have been taken what different narratives have been taken relative to the overall disclosure or different forms of disclosure that some people have been privy to but i cannot help but think folks if i'm being completely honest with all of you that it's right in front of our faces now how do we know this look at people.eecs.berkeley.edu you again berkeley you know mainstream media the, the i would dare to say majestic 12 zodiac is in charge of all this now look look at this right over here 
Recently, there's been intense interest in claims about the performance of the D-Wave machine. In this paper, we outline a simple classical model and show that it achieves excellent correlation with published input-output behavior of the D-Wave 1 machine on 108 qubits. While raising questions about how quantum the D-Wave machine is, the new model also provides additional algorithmic insights into the nature of the native computational problem solved by the D-Wave machine. Again, in a future world of quantum devices, it will become increasingly important to test what these devices behave according to specification. Now, interestingly enough, look at this. Recently, this last issue was featured prominently in the context of the D-Wave machine amidst questions about to what extent it is, quote, truly quantum and whether it provides speedups over classical computers. Now, interestingly enough, this is the same qubit models that, again, the 108 qubits that were essentially harnessed allegedly within the, the Dolce base in order to speak to that particular extraterrestrial J-Rod. Now, again, this is published in May 2014, and we're seeing the dissemination of some of these different types of quantum entanglement computing machines to be coming out very shortly. Again, even though they had this all the way back in the 80s, which also corroborates and substantiates the Paul Benowitz Alien War Plans document about those aliens having chips in their minds and using whenever they enter Earth, whether they're friendly with humans and other, you know, humanly uh, aligned species or not, or whether they're with the Galactic Federation or not, must sort of announce their presence or else they will be moved away immediately. Now, take a look at this right over here. The new model also provides interesting algorithmic insights into the native computational problems solved by the D-Wave machine, again, how convenient that it was solved, which is to find the ground state of a classical icing spin glass on a certain interaction graph. Now, again, a particular interaction graph. Now, what we're going to find here is that the D-Wave architecture and tunneling seems to be uh, corroborated by, again, the different forms of symbolism, as we see here, the chimera graph structure implemented by the D-Wave one. Again, you know, chimeras, chupacabras, that whole thing over there. Interestingly enough, the naming of it relative to the words esoterically that are given that cannot be seen within this dimension parallel to that of what we're seeing with this type of D-Wave quantum computer architecture, which also seems to show that through tunneling, we found quite substantial, and I guess you could say premature statements, I don't want to say premature, but some will say that by people like Clifford Stone, again, traversable wormholes using quantum tunneling. Again, and different forms like this. The D-Wave machine places a superconducting flux qubit at each node of the Chimera graph. Now again, look at these terms. I'm not trying to make random connections where there aren't any, but flux. The flux liner, right? The flux liner craft from 20, 30, 40 years ago, where you could see it sort of accesses the utmost layer of this dimension, and this is one form of a form of drop feeding through that. Now we will see here as well that again... To evaluate our model, we simulated on the experimental data reported in number 11, which presented the main evidence in favor of the existence of large-scale quantum effects in the D-Wave machines. The paper recorded the input-output behavior of D-Wave 1 on a thousand randomly chosen inputs, noting its probability of success in finding the exact ground state for each instance. Okay, it then compared the success probability to those of three different models, simulated quantum annealing, simulated annealing, and classical spin dynamics suggested in number 25. Look at this right over here. The paper produces two pieces of evidence. Firstly, they observe that the histogram of success probabilities of D-Wave 1 is consistent with that of simulated quantum annealing rather than those of the two classical models. All right, now again, we're finding here what that says is essentially... <laughs> ironically enough, separate but same uh, simultaneously, and the way in which we could perceive that is giving the name quantum entanglement. Now, again, we use that word entanglement relative to the, to the definition that we give it, but it is also esoterically giving different forms of dissemination to create a perception within our minds in a way that we'd understand it. So, for example, in one of last week's Zoom calls, I found quite interesting that there may have been some form of curation, coercion, and manipulation of the Latin language relative to modern human history within the incursion of extraterrestrial influence that removed certain words, not because of the way we would pronounce them, but because of, of the way we would esoterically give meaning to those words. And we know this because, for example, if all we have to do is take a step back and look, for example, at, you know, um, we see here the, excuse me, uh, Masero Emoto's experiments, we see that this form of feeling and thought, as I mentioned earlier, relative to that of, again, you know, the Tenet film of feeling things is there is some consistency and there is some evidence to corroborate such a statement. Again, Clifford Stone, they feel what you feel, you know, that whole concept of feeling. Now we see here the role of a transverse field. What we'll find here, particular uh, relative to the, the role of the transverse field is that, again, 
we'll find, in, in contrast, in our model, the time-dependent Hamiltonian emits only a very small number of local minima when t is small, t being a variable, and again, I'm not pretending to be a scientist, but notice as we scroll down to this particular visual right over here, we're going to find the same, what, what publicly has been referred to as sacred or forbidden geometry, you know, books that are, you know, thousands of dollars, hundreds of dollars on Amazon. The, the one I could probably think of most recently is Q Mechanics by um, our, our good friend of the show, Scott Brother. Thanks for a for pointing me pointing that out to me and again we find here clusters all right and effective problem size these are all the different forms of very very small and references look scientific america you name it peer reviewed all of that these are references to small forms of drop feeding okay around quantum entanglement that is relative to our human perception of definitions that have limited us in a suppressive way due to again the the, the limiting and suppression censorship and coercion of institutional patriarchal and hierarchical structures over the years, whether that's through human influence or extraterrestrial influence or otherwise, what we're seeing is, again, whether it's the Vatican, whether it's, you know, the the the, uh, the, the, the Bible, the King James Bible, whether it's the Quran, whether it's the, the Vimana spoken about in the Indian scriptures, you name it, there is a deliberate form of censorship relative to this, the handful of main religions, just like the handful of main news networks or the handful of main you know, scientific, scientific academic institutions that seem to form a cover up aspect as Jeremy Riss referred to as, you know, dumping bins, you come up with something new and it gets dumped form, it gets dumped into into this type of sort of uh, way of understanding what's happening in relative to a suppressed cover up to the masses. Now, again, what I also find equally as interesting is that we'll find here that the teams in which seem to be running such operations are familiar with what's happening. Okay, and again, going back to the I believe, it's called the ACIOS team, we will see as well, they use D-Wave technology, okay, using this type of quantum entanglement, quote-unquote, proposal, and I say that with air quotes because this is a surface-level proposal, if you will, except in a much more sophisticated manner on a lower level or lower aspect of things in order to, again, break into some of these deep underground military bases to see if they're penetrable, in order to, again, use, use these D-Wave machines for asset recovery, using high-level D-Wave machines to speak to other beings at other parts of the galaxy or other dimensions without needing to travel, using these D-Wave machines to uh, allegedly be able to go to Antarctica and because of the nature of the poles, again, of the magnetic poles relative to the entrance into what is called Agartha, you can actually access through the Schumann resonance, the moon, literally, as we've seen in some cases, some individuals have posted on TikTok, I know it sounds funny, hikes of them in Antarctica in places they should not be, they walk past a big, big wall, some type of ice wall, if you will, and they see the moon there. Now, again, I'm not trying to, you know, uh, push or not push the flat earth proposal but again it only substantiates that of pocket dimensions it only substantiates that of what we see here using d-wave systems and quantum entanglement at a much much larger level to suppress the esoteric knowledge of the people in a way that again uses the paranormal aspect to make individuals like ones that are familiar with aliens to think oh man esp and parano extrasensory perception paranormal crap that's all nonsense that's all bs so again so, folks, let me know what you think. I hope this kind of came full circle for all of you. I, I really hope that you enjoy this. Uh, we got lots more coming for the members. We got, you know, the Archon episodes. Uh, we have uh, more members-only episodes that Camden's working on. And we'll catch all of you very, very soon. Cheers.